screen. Are you ready for the Word of God? Yeah. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John 5 and Acts 19. If you don't mind standing for the reading of God's Word, I would greatly appreciate that honor and respect to Him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I love you. I love you, Lord. Thank you. First uh, John chapter 5 and verse 4. Today I'm going to be teaching on the doctrine of baptism, something that I don't know that I've ever taught in the church before, but I want you to leave today with a full understanding of why we get water baptized. I also want you to leave with a theological understanding of what getting baptized says about your life and what you can declare and claim after you've been water baptized. Amen. How many of you have been water baptized? Beautiful. Beautiful. Today, if you don't already know, you're going to find out why you were water baptized. 1 John 5, verse 4, and then we're going to baptize folks at the end of today's service. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three, verse 7, that now I, I want you to understand for those that are real uh, scholars in the Word, that verse 7 has been highly um, uh, um, and apologetically defended back and forth with a lot of ancient Greek theologians here in verse 7. But please understand that the context of verse 7 is multiplied throughout all of Scripture. And so we have a reference throughout all of our Bible that first verse 7 is entirely accurate. Verse 7, the Bible says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and what? And the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. This is God testifying of Himself in heaven. That in heaven, it is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Somebody say the Word. We'll get to that in a little bit. But the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now watch, when this um, dispenses or manifests onto the earth, when it touches the earth, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, we see all three baptisms in Scripture. Yes, there are three baptisms in Scripture. I'm going to very briefly touch on it here, but as it gets closer to the day of Pentecost, I will go into this in more detail. But there are three baptisms, and they're found here in reverse order in verse 8. The Bible says, And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. The three baptisms are the first one that you experience is the Holy Spirit baptizes us, the Bible says, into the body or into the blood. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. When you got saved, how many of you got saved? You only got saved because the Holy Ghost brought you in. Aren't you thankful today that the Spirit of God brought you in and baptized you in the pure and precious blood of Jesus Christ? Then after that, as, as, as a public symbol of that faith, we're going to talk about this today, disciples baptize you in water. Disciples baptize you. How many of you believe you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? That means you can take folks at your work into the retention pond and baptize them when they give their life to the Lord. Now, Jesus also has a baptism. John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but this, this, this dude coming after me, He's going to put some fire on this thing. So Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. This is where Pentecost comes from. So the first baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And that last one there is the baptism of Jesus into the fullness of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And all three of these baptisms are available to everyone. Don't give me any of that mess that that third one is only available to a select few people that have the gift. No, your heavenly prayer language, come on, your heavenly worship language is available to everyone. And we see all three of these baptisms play out in the early church. I'll show you in Acts 19. It's, it's not just a, 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 a gospel thing. It is in the church we see this happening, very specifically in the church of Ephesus. Paul is there in Ephesus on a journey, and he says in verse 2 that he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there's a Holy Ghost. 
he said, well, what were you baptized in? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, that's good. John baptized with the baptism of repentance. Somebody say, that's the blood. Telling the people to believe that he, the one was coming after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, then, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is in water. They were taken and they were baptized in water. Verse 6, and then when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began to speak in tongues and they began to prophesy. Somebody say that's in the Spirit. We see the baptism into the body, we see the baptism in water, and we see the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Baptism comes from a Greek word called baptizo, which means fully immersed. It means to have a cleansing by submerging. It actually means to be overwhelmed. That when we take people today down in that water, they are testifying that Jesus has overwhelmed them, that his goodness has overtaken them, that he's taken their mind, he's taken their spirit, he's taken their soul, he's taken their family, he has overwhelmed overwhelmed everything in their life. Is there anybody in the room that can testify that Jesus has overwhelmed you? Come on, that his goodness and his grace and his favor has overwhelmed you. So baptism is all about being fully immersed in all that God is and giving up control. So in baptism, we are publicly declaring that our life is not our own. That is it in simple form. Baptism is declaring, I am no longer an owner of this life. I steward what belongs to him. So today we're going to talk about the doctrine of baptism and we're going to learn why we get water baptized. Sound like fun? Sounds like fun to the shepherd. All right. Lord, we love you and we thank you and you're so good and there's no one like you. Blessed is the name of the Lord. For the name of the Lord is to be praised. Oh, sweet Jesus, move in this house. Lord, this is your word. I thank you for clarity and precision. I thank you for the fire that shall come forth today out of your word. I pray that today, Lord, that we would have an understanding that pleases your heart on water baptism. Lord, not only that we would have an understanding, but for those that have been water baptized, that have a good understanding, I pray that today would just add on to the knowledge that they have so they can apologetically defend our faith as it relates to this, but also to minister it. Lord, to those that are around them, whether it be in the church or in the marketplace. Lord, teach us your ways, that we may know you, that we may find your favor. For there is no one like our God. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen. Before you're seated, just shake hands with two or three people. Hug their neck. Introduce yourself. Be nice to them. Don't slap them today. Be nice to them. All right, so baptism is all about being fully immersed. Somebody say immersed. Immersed, immersed. immersed. So number one, when I am baptized, I am first immersed in repentance. Somebody say repent. repent. Now let's get a few things under our belt this morning. There are two contrasting elitist theological thoughts on baptism, and I want to go ahead and tell you before I tell you what they are, that they are both absolutely wrong. Okay? There are two, two thoughts on baptism, and one of them is you must, absolutely must be baptized in water or you will not go to heaven. Wrong. And I'm going to show you why in a minute. Baptism, the other thought is baptism is not important at all. It's unnecessary. You don't need to get baptized. So let me rebuttal it with two things. You're going to be real surprised when you get to heaven if you think that when you go around asking for everybody's baptism card, that everybody is going to have a baptism card. There are going to be people in heaven that were never baptized in water. There'll be people in heaven that you were surprised that got there. And there'll be some folk that ain't there that you was watching preach on. Oh, no, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done it. Lord, have mercy. That you can be like, Where, where's so-and-so at? Well, 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 we're not going to talk about them right now. They didn't quite make it. But there are going to be people when you get to heaven that were not water baptized. But also, you cannot be fully obedient to Christ and ignore the significance of baptism. 
You can't be fully obedient to Christ Jesus and ignore how significant baptism is. Also, another note here at this church. I don't know about your last church. I don't know about the church you were raised in, but we don't sprinkle babies at this church. Okay, and I want you to understand why we don't. I'm not saying that to be funny, but we don't sprinkle babies. If we're going to baptize somebody, we're going to take them all the way under the water. If they're real nasty people, we're going to hold them down a little bit longer. So if you're getting baptized today and you wonder why you can't breathe, it's because somebody whispered in the person's ear that you ain't really right, so we're going to hold you down a little longer. I'll tell you what happens when you sprinkle babies with, with water is it doesn't save them. It just makes them mad. Okay? I've had people ask before in the past, well, I, I got a six-month-old. Will you baptize them and fully submerge them? I said, no. No, we will not do that, and here's why. Baptism is a choice and a response of love. It is a choice that you make based off the knowledge that you have that Jesus Christ is your Lord and personal Savior. And when you are accountable enough to be able to articulate that out of your heart and out of your mouth that that's who he is, at that moment then, then you are qualified, we should say, that's probably, there's probably a better word, but you are uh, positioned to then be baptism because you are accountable for what you're doing. Sprinkling water on a baby does not do anything for them whatsoever. However, when you come to the age of accountability and you get baptized, it is very significant according to the life of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's move forward to John the Baptist, the forerunner, as he prepares the way for Jesus. His entire ministry was this statement. Repent for the, the kingdom is at hand. Repent for the word is here. Repent. God is before us. Repent, John said. All of heaven has broken into the earth. John had an understanding of what was happening in the earth in that moment when Jesus came walking down the Jordan River. He understood even before that very day that the kingdom of God was at hand. It would do us good to have a knowledge and understanding and revelation and sensitivity on what God is doing in the earth today. And I pray that there would be a John the Baptist sensitivity that runs throughout this church, through our prayer teams, through our intercessory teams, through our youth and through our children. Well, we have a keen spiritual awareness of where God is and how God's moving. So John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Now, Jesus, the one who became sin but knew no sin, he became sin, put on sin. We talked about last week. He was born into the same sinful system that we were born into in order that he might defeat that system so that he could release the power to you so that you could defeat that system. He became sin, but he knew no sin. And Jesus, the one who was carrying sin on his shoulders, came walking down the Jordan River, and even Jesus gets baptized in waters of repentance. Now, up until this moment in Scripture, uh, 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 the people of God had a moral code on the earth. It was known as the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. This was the moral code, but the problem with the Ten Commandments was that it did not have the power to save it did not have the power to transform. It only had the power to show you where you were wrong according to the will of God. And the first thing that Jesus does to begin his ministry is even Jesus carrying the weight of our sin gets baptized in water it gets baptized in waters of repentance. If Jesus himself got baptized in repentance, how much more necessary is it for us to also get baptized in repentance? While Jesus carried the weight of sin on him, we got sin on the inside of us, and we need to be baptized in waters of repentance. Amen? Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the what? Forgiveness of your sins. Baptism has always been about getting immersed in repentance. Somebody say repent. repent. Now, watch, because a lot of people say they want repentance. A lot of people say, I'm willing to repent, I'm willing to repent, but in actuality, they don't want repentance, they want forgiveness because they want to avoid guilt. So they want justification without transformation. There's a big difference between saying I'm sorry and having godly sorrow. 
I'm sorry is an emotional response to wanting to avoid guilt, to wanting to avoid some repercussion. I'm sorry, I'm not saying is bad. I'm saying if all that happens after you have released an offense in the earth is all you do is say, I'm sorry, to protect your reputation versus righteousness in your life, then you are not being transformed. You are just band-aiding an issue that you have in your life and you are hoping, watch, that you can emotionally manipulate the other person person that was offended or even also manipulate God into forgetting about what you did and then moving on with your life yet not being transformed. Thus the same offense and the same curse and the same sin perpetuates through your life and for 10, 20 years you wonder why I thought I got saved but I'm struggling with the same issues that I struggled with before I got saved because you came to an altar and prayed a sorry prayer, not a prayer of repentance. And when you say sorry you're saying Lord I want you just to forget about it but when you repent repent means to change your mind repent means to do an about face repent means to turn from what you knew before let me say this today Jesus's grace will take you right where you are that's forgiveness but Jesus's truth will never leave you there that's why he's full the Bible says of grace and truth Grace will take you right in your mess. I'm so thankful I didn't have to get cleaned up to come to Jesus. That grace came and found me. Are you thankful today that grace came and found you right where you were? Didn't demand you to get everything fixed and everything right and have all the right thoughts and have it all figured out. But grace came down into your mess and picked you up and then introduced you to something called truth. And it is inside of truth that we begin to learn the knowledge of our inheritance in Christ Jesus, Ephesians then we start to repent from our wicked ways, which means we are now turning more toward Jesus and less from this world. So we are saved by grace through faith, period. Ain't no plus to it. We are saved by grace through faith, period, the end. But we are transformed by truth through repentance. So being immersed in repentance is saying, I have given up control of my life and I am fully submitted to the life of Christ. My my baptism is proof that I have changed my mind. Are you getting baptized today? Raise your hand. If you, so, okay. I think we've got 50 or 60 this week and a a whole slew of people next Sunday as well. We're doing baptism two Sundays in a row. But when you get baptized today, what you are declaring and you're decreeing is you're saying, my life is no longer mine. I have changed my mind. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. What's awesome is when we do this, the word repentance is also where we get our English word penthouse. And penthouse means to return to the top. That's where we get our English word penthouse, to return to the top. So repent is when you come in low, then Christ takes you up high. Oh, thank you, Jesus. When I get baptized in water, I'm declaring that he took me low, but he brought me up high. You are now a new creation through Christ Jesus, and the low things that used to hold you back and the weight that used to hold you down no longer holds you down. Some of you got baptized a long time ago. You need to remember that you came in low, but God brought you up high. Quit stooping back down low for that offense. Quit stooping down low for that bitterness. You've been delivered from low-level thinking, and Jesus came in and scooped you up out of the miry clay and put you back in a high place. So when you're baptized, you are publicly declaring, I was forgiven at a low place, but through repentance, God restored me to a high place. Okay? So number one, baptism is being immersed in repentance. Number two, when I am baptized, I'm immersed in the word. Come on, if you read the Bible, it'll talk to you. Water is often used in the Bible to describe the word in Scripture. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5 to wash yourself with the water of the word. In John 7, the Bible says that when we are in Christ Jesus, that out of us will flow rivers of living water. Revelation 19, Jesus is called his name. Jesus was on the earth, but his name in in heaven is the word of God. In Revelation 19, he is the word. That is his name. 
And then on the cross, when they pierced Jesus' side, what flowed out of him in John 19? Water flowed out of him because Jesus was the Word. Jesus is the Word. Jesus will forever be the Word. And the Word came, and John said, it dwelt among us. And Logos put on flesh and became like one of us in order to deliver us from the lower lover life that we had been living. So when we say that Jesus is the head of the body, you believe that? What we are also saying is the Word is the head of the body. I need you to understand what we're saying when you say Jesus is the head because I don't want you to equate that to just a random name. What we are saying is the word is my head. The word is above me. The word trumps everything in my life. The word dictates everything I do. The word tells me how I should feel. The word tells me how I should process data. The word tells me how I should make decisions. The word tells me what I should do with that dream I had last night. The word tells me how how to steward a prophetic word. It is the word of God that confirms the will of God. The word is over me. When you get baptized, you're saying the word is above everything else. So when we get baptized, we go down into the word or the water. The word washes away the old and we come up acknowledging that we are one with the word. We're not separate. We are one with the word. Our baptism is sending a signal to every person, to every demon that's around us, to every desire that is within us. We are sending a signal saying, I am one with the word. I do not have my own opinions, preferences, ambitions, or culture. When I got saved and baptized, I came out with his, his truth. I came out with his preference. I came out with his ideas. I came out with his kingdom culture. The word is the highest authority in my life. And if it goes against the word, baby, I don't go with it. I said, if it goes against the word, I don't go with it. I can't partner with it. If it's not in the word, I can't put my name on it. If it's not in the word, I can't preach about it. If it's not in the word, wherever the word goes, I have to go because when I got baptized, I said, my life is no longer my own life. I don't get to feel this way. Yes. Feelings may come. Yes. I have opinions, but every one of them has to get submitted under the word of God. I would even question our walk with God if we are unwilling to submit our preferences under the word of God. No, I know that's not the most popular preaching because we all want to feel our own way and have our own opinion and have our own preference. But I'm telling you, I died. When I gave my life to Jesus, Jeremy Dunn died and I was resurrected as a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am a chosen race. I am a royal priesthood in him. So number one, I get, I get immersed in repentance. Number two, I get immersed in the word. Number three, when I get baptized, I'm immersed in accountability. Oh, my, 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 don't say that word in church. We don't like accountability. Galatians 3, 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave. No, there's not replacement theology. There's neither slave nor free. There is no male, there is no female, for you are all, this is the word. If you want to get mad at somebody, get mad at God. Take it up with the author of the word. You are one in what? Which is the word. We are one. We find unity in the word of God. I could preach a whole nother message right now. We find unity in the Word of God. We find our common ground in the Word of God. When we disagree together, we come back to the Word of God. When I've hurt you or when you've hurt me, we come back to the Word of God. Real mature believers know how to take offense and use it as a weapon against the enemy because iron sharpens iron. You offended me. Let's get in the Word together. And when we come out of this thing, I'm going to repent. You're going to repent. And we're going to grow in Christ Jesus. That's what mature believers do immature believers take their offense run on social media put passive aggressive posts out they whine about it they fuss about it they call up people on the telephone that's going to side with them because they want somebody to stroke their unauthorized fire 
Oh, I can't. It's an unauthorized passion. It is an unauthorized fire. And I know you're fired up about it. And I know you're passionate about it. But if it's not been sanctioned and authorized by the word of God, then you need to submit that passion back to God so he can reroute you through the word of God so that that passion can now produce maturity. Okay? I don't have time to go there further. <laughs> Paul is talking to the entire church. He gets up in the church and says it publicly in a forum like this. He says, I just want to let all y'all know. If you've been baptized, stand up in this room. Stand up. This is essentially what Paul was doing. He was saying, everybody that's sitting down, I want you to look around this room. Everybody that's standing up. I want you to look around this room. He said, these folks that have been baptized, they have publicly put on Christ. They have declared that they are not Jew, not Greek, not male, not female, but they are one in Christ. They are a chosen race of God's people. In other words, hey, church. Oh, how would this fly today? Well, we're going to find out because I'm doing it right now. <laughs> hey, church. See everybody standing? There's an expectation on those that have been baptized to exemplify Christ in every circumstance. <laughs> Sit back down. So when you get baptized today, you are letting everybody in this room know that you are going to exemplify Christ in everything that you do from here on out. You are acknowledging that you no longer are Jew, Greek, male, female, but you are one in Christ. Most people love accountability until they are the ones being held accountable. So when, we, when preachers get up and say, hey, we're going to preach on accountability, folks are like, yeah! But they're thinking about their neighbor their entire time. They're thinking about their husband or their wife or that old preacher that did them wrong in that church back in 1996. Until you are the one being held accountable. I wish I had, Elijah, I wish I had more time here. Because here's what we say. Don't judge me. If you read the Bible, don't judge me. Don't judge me. I don't want this to be a judgmental church. I don't want this to be, you made everybody stand up and you told everybody I'm not Jew, not Greek, not Gentile. I'm going to write a bad review on this. They judging folk up in this house. They judging folk. Let me tell you, stand up again if you've been baptized real quick and then sit back down real quick. Okay, sit back down. Do you know according to the word, according to the word, we have the right to judge one another? Oh, you do know that? We have the right to judge insiders. You're not supposed to judge outsiders, but you've got the right to judge insiders. So when I look at you and see you ain't living the life you should be living, and I come to you and I say, baby, you need to tighten up and straighten things up, that's not being judgmental. That's holding you accountable to the Word of God. I'd rather you see it in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. Can I say that? Okay, I can say it. And most of the people, sorry, I just had to have a little conversation with the Lord there. Most of the people that hate accountability and equate accountability inside the church with judgment are actually people that enjoy rebellion more than they enjoy submission. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. But now, I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, okay? This is an insider in the church. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or reveler or drunkard or swindler, not even eat with such one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? We don't judge outsiders. Is it not for those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those on the outside Purge the evil person from among you. I got one my God 
reading the Bible. Everybody was shouting, I read the word because it's, oh, that feels a little harsh. I don't like the way that feels. Get used to it. The more you read your Bible, the more your flesh is going to get offended. Judgment in the church cannot be a form, though, of guilt and punishment. You cannot judge your brother or sister in the church in order to render a punishment or a sentence to them. That is absolutely not your job. Judgment in the church, though, can be a level of accountability, holding someone in the body accountable to a bill biblical standard. So when you see somebody, whether it's online, social media, uh, in the lobby, out in public, when you see them acting a fool, judging them is not trying to condemn them into a punished place or try to ruin them based off what they did. It's when you privately go to them, as the Bible declares, and you say, hey, listen, there's an issue in your lifestyle in this area. Let me help walk with you and find the truth. That's still judging somebody inside the church but that judgment is to lift them, not to pull them down. But we've got a very skewed perception of judgment, so we say, don't judge me. But let me go ahead and tell you this. When I'm baptized, I'm no longer an outsider. I'm immersed now in the body of Christ. This changes everything. It changes everything when you get immersed in the body of Christ. So if my life isn't pleasing to God, if my life is not bringing God glory, if I'm holding an offense, if I'm, if I'm straying in the faith, if I'm backsliding, if I'm all up in my feelings, please, please don't sit back and let me fall. Please judge me. Please come to me and hold me accountable. Please don't let me stumble and fall. Please help me before I ever trip in that hole. Please come to me and say, hey, pastor, I need you to look at this. I don't think this is right. You shouldn't be. Please go to your brother or your sister and say, listen, I need you to redirect yourself here because the word of God says you can't act like that. You can't speak like that. Please love each other enough to judge one another. Pastor, I don't want that. I don't like this kind of preaching. I don't want to be judged. I know because we have developed a culture within the church of folks that want Christian titles without Christian lifestyle. So give me a title, give me a position, but I don't want the lifestyle. This is why we're seeing what we're seeing in the body of Christ today is because there's a lack of judgment with insiders, a lack of accountability. So those that welcome spiritual accountability will walk in spiritual advancement. You will walk in supernatural advancement if you will welcome spiritual accountability. Okay? Last one is this. Number four, when I'm baptized, I'm immersed in death, burial, and resurrection. Now, when I finish this, the baptism ease, is that a word? I don't know. The baptism ease are going to get ready for baptism. And, and those of you, if there's some of you in here that really quickly, you want to just jump in. We got some change of clothes for you. If you want to jump in, we'll, we'll baptize you as well. I don't want to leave nobody out today. But if you want to schedule it, we got room third service. And we got room next week because we're doing baptism as well next week because there's so many people that wanted to profess their faith publicly, which is a beautiful thing. When I'm baptized, I'm immersed in death, burial, and resurrection. Baptized rep baptism excuse me, represents my past, my present, and my future. My past, my present, and my future. Romans 6 has got all three of them. Watch. First is verse 3, my past. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Romans 6, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. You see that tank over there? Everybody look at that tank. You know what that is? That is a watery tomb. That is a tomb right there. And we are about to bury and have the funeral of over 100 people, 100 plus people the next two weeks who are going to go down in that water and say, I am dying and I am burying my past life. And I'm going to tell you, nobody is going to grieve but the devil. The devil is going to grieve at this funeral because he's going to say, I lost another one. I tried to get their children. I tried to get their family. I tried to get their babies. I tried to get them to commit suicide. I tried to get them strung out on drugs. I tried to get them to be hateful. I tried to get him to be mean and the devil is going to grieve this funeral today because you are going to come, go down old and you're going to come up new in Christ Jesus. You are no longer the old, but you behold that new thing in Christ Jesus. Now the present in verse four, go to verse four, 
the continuation of verse 4. While we're buried with him in baptism, in order, the reason we go down is in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So when we go down, we are burying our past. When we come up, we are coming up with life and life more abundantly. It is when we come up that we are publicly acknowledging that we are now joint heirs, that I am no longer what I used to be, but now I'm a son of God. But then in the future, our new life also has a promise. For if we have been united with him in death like this, that we shall certainly be united with him in resurrection like this. One day, all those buried with Christ will rise again and will live in eternally and as we live eternally we will be called up and it'll be without spot or wrinkle and we will be called the bride of Christ somebody say the bride the bride the bride give, give me some sweet some 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 music baptism ease if you guys will go over here go over there and line up and get ready and anybody else that wants to jump in if you sit next to somebody that you know good and well needs to be in that water, just, just grab their hand and walk them on up there. Hallelujah. So when we get baptized, it's important for us to get today. And when we come up, we are saying we are married to the groom. And we're saying, groom, you're my head. You are the primo authority in my life. The primo authority in my life. And you matter more than everything. And so I'm going to submit as your bride. Now, isn't it interesting that the first thing Jesus does to start his ministry is Jesus gets baptized. The first thing he does to get baptized. Do you know when he's ascending into heaven, the last thing he commands us to do? Go and make disciples and do what with them? And baptize them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So Jesus tells us that in his life, he honored the baptism of repentance, but then also commanded us that when we go make disciples, that we are also to baptize them in water. Now, I'll give you this last example. We're going to get ready. You guys are about to jump in that water, all right? But another thing that baptism is, when we say it's a public declaration of our faith, a public declaration, when we say that, um, my wife and I, we are married. Praise God. For a long time. Uh, it's been 18 years. Been together 21. Known each other for 21 years. 21 years. Been married for 18 and I thank God for every single one of us that it keeps on getting better. It keeps on getting better. But she knows that we are married. No matter what, I, she knows that we are married. She got the papers, the courthouse papers, all of that. You got the pictures. She knows that we are married. But see, there are other folk that may not know that. So I wear this thing called a wedding ring. This wedding ring right here is notifying everybody else that I'm hers, I'm not yours. Fellas, when you wear your wedding ring, you're letting every other lady know, uh-uh, nope, don't you even mess with me, I am not yours, I belong to somebody else I've been spoken for. When you get baptized today, let's call it like a wedding ring where you're letting the devil know that you belong to Jesus. You already married. You belong to him and you're not going to sell out for a lower lover. Today's baptism is you putting on that wedding ring and saying, I'm going to wear this thing to work. I'm going to wear it to the gym. I'm going to wear it in the city. I'm not going to take this off. We're not just married on Sunday, but I've given my life to Jesus. If Jesus did it and Jesus commanded it, why would we not participate in it church kingdom culture will you stand to your feet and let's worship again as we celebrate things that are dying and things that are living again